afternoon, we're going to hear from our outstanding featured speaker, Seth Siegel. And <laughs> then we'll have a break for a networking session. And as I announced to some of you, Seth has agreed to stay around and sign books. And we have his book for sale out in the main room. The college bookstore um, was able to come in and, and take care of that vending for us. Uh, they, take, they told me to let you know they will take cash or cards. Uh, so they will do either. Uh, I met Seth at a national conference earlier this year on clean water. And his impressive bio is on page three. Um, he's a senior policy fellow for the University of Wisconsin, um, is an attorney and an author, and is really just an outstanding person to have here with all of you. But I wanna tell you why I'm so excited to have him here with us today. So on the plane home from the water conference, I started reading his book, Let There Be Water, Israel's Solution to a Water Starved World, and I quickly discovered why it's on the New York Times bestseller list. New Jersey and Israel share many threads. We're roughly the same size. We're approximately the same population. We've strong business, uh, business ties, and we have a fierce hometown pride. Um, New Jersey and Israel also share some water worries. In the Garden State, we learned this morning that some of our primary water problems are that we have too much water, and we see that through flooding, except for when we don't have enough of it, as we experience through drought, and we're seeing in the drought watch for half of New Jersey right now. So we have too much, except for when we don't have enough. Uh, Israel, however, is a landlocked country, so they have a particular issue with having access to water that New Jersey, as we saw with our precipitation levels, does not share. Um, when I started to learn, what I started to learn from Seth's book is that Israel has successfully blossomed from a water-starved nation to a water-rich nation. So how do they do this? Well, he's gonna tell us, but there's a comprehensive approach of cultural, technological, and policy shifting that has happened that I think provides ample room for us to learn from. So we can fight the battles in Trenton, we can fight the battles at our planning board meetings, but a systemic change in the way that we approach water is really, I think, what we have an opportunity to learn from Israel. I wanna grab the book one second. Before I surrender the microphone, I just, I wanna share, maybe some of you will help me with telling a childhood nursery rhyme that I'm sure many of us know. So I'm out on a limb here, I need some audience participation. But there's an American nursery rhyme, and it's raining today, so it's apropos, but it's rain, rain, go away. Does that trigger a bell? So rain, rain, go away. Right, yeah. So in Israel, and I'm sure this loses something in the translation, but the nursery rhyme is rain, rain from the skies, all day long drops of water. Drip, drop, drip, drop, clap your hands. So it's a celebration of rain rather than telling it to get out of here. And so I like the rain, and I like when the water comes down. It feels good to me. Um, and so that kind of a shift in our culture is something that takes a long time, but I think we have a lot to, to learn. And I know that the way you are working in your communities, because I see it through the Achievement Awards, I see it through the assistance requests, I see it through the stories that we tell in the ANJAC News, I know change is possible because you're doing it. And so again, I wanna thank you, I wanna celebrate you, um, and I wanna invite you to, to read Seth's bio and let's tune in and listen to him now. And I really have to tell you, I, this, is, this is a fabulous book and I highly encourage it. So Seth, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. Right. Uh, does that uh, through your videographer here? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, you can. Beautiful. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, I'll wander around a little bit from time to time as well, if that's okay. And I'm, I'm going to try to keep my eye on the time. 
Because uh, my absolute favorite part of all this is Q&A, so I can answer the questions that are of interest to you. So let me just uh, set my watch if I can. There we go. Okay, four o'clock today. Is that okay if I stop? <laughs> I, I come from the Fidel Castro School of Short Speeches, so uh, I'll do what I can do. Uh, first of all, Jennifer, I want to thank you not only for inviting me, but I want to thank you for that really remarkable introduction because you uh, uh, not only spared me the first 10 minutes of my talk. But you, well, no, seriously, but you really have internalized the message of the book, and I'm very grateful to you that you have done that and helped share that with the audience. Uh, this, this book has been a bit of a Cinderella experience for me. Books about, uh, books about uh, water in uh, somewhat obscure uh, countries don't generally make it to the New York Times bestseller list, and I surely did not expect this here either. I'll tell you the story of how the book came to be written in a moment or two, but, uh, but what I do want to share with you is that this is kind of a milestone date. Uh, uh, the book came out almost exactly a year ago. I went on my speaking tour on October 1st last year. I have been a man on a mission because the exposure and the popularity of the book has given me an opportunity to do what I have most wanted to do, which is to have an impact on the public policy conversation about water something that every one of you wake up in the, wakes up in the morning thinking about and worrying about and wondering how you can expand awareness of public officials, of the media and others. And I have been given this, truly this great Cinderella-like gift to be able to do this. So today is September 30th. I went on tour on October 1st. And this, my assistant marks each uh, talk. This is my 180th audience talk. Uh, and, um, and thank you. And it has been, although I, I adore my wife and I miss her very much being on the road, other than that, it has been the absolute gift of a lifetime to be able to help sort of pull Revere-like, go around everywhere, dry places, wet places, agricultural communities, policy groups, environmental groups, state legislatures, the U.S. Congress, the United Nations, uh, and other places, and be able to tell this, I think, captivating and important story. And let me frame for you why it's a captivating, important story. It's a captivating, important story because it also taps into something much larger that is going on in our lives right now. Whoever it is that you support for president, whoever it is you support for different offices, the one common theme I hear from everyone everywhere is a general sense of malaise and unhappiness about the way our governance is going. And part of the reason for that is not just the choice of candidates, it's also the feeling that government has somehow or other not come through with its most basic promises. I'm going to come back to this theme later. But what I want to say is that when government delivers on its promises, when government helps us to live our lives so that we hardly even notice that we have problems, that's a time when citizenry feels more empowered and more desirous and also able to give more authority to our elected officials and to delegate more responsibility. And I can't emphasize enough that success in the area of basic things like water and the environment so that people don't have to think that they themselves or their children will be poisoned is of utmost importance. What we saw in Flint early this year is actually not a one-off. There are over 2,000 communities in the United States that have similarly toxic pipes and pumps. And therefore, that's a time where everyone everywhere, not just in Flint, can step back and say, what about me? How do I trust my government's situation? Okay, so what am I hoping for? I'm hoping for it to raise awareness. Now, Candace, I want to, uh, Candace, right? Is that right? Candace, I, I don't know when you started in this work. I, I don't think you said the year. But I want to also say that what I'm dreaming of and hoping for, and I think Candace can reinforce some of this, is absolutely very doable. We need a public awakening and we need actually a citizen's revolution. And I think, Candace, in your lifetime, you have seen exactly that. I am talking today not about water quality per se, although somewhat I am. I'm talking primarily about water quantity, the issue of scarcity. Now, in 1962, a book came out that changed America and in turn changed the world. You know that book, Candace? Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, 1962. An unknown environmentalist comes out with this book and slowly it becomes, seeps into popular consciousness. At that time, our air was dirty our water was dirty. Farm communities could use whatever pesticides they wanted, regardless of whatever impact it would have downstream on our water supply, right? 
1962. I'm sure this audience will be able to tell me when the first Earth Day was. Does anyone here know? April 22nd, 1970. And in December 9th, 1970, a president who's not, his legacy is not as a great environmentalist, Richard Nixon, signs into law the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. Why? Because the elected officials, and I'm not talking about the local, local officials, I'm talking about the national figures, they responded to the call of the people. You all here, and the reason why I was so excited when Jennifer called me and asked me why to come and speak here, the reason I'm so excited is because you all here, every one of you, are my partner, I hope, and I hope every one of you leaves here thinking of yourselves, not just that you heard a nice speech, if you think it is a nice speech, but that you actually are empowered and have tools if you didn't already have them, and you have the will, because you had the knowledge already, but you have the will to go out and be a Paul Revere or Paula Revere of your own. So I, I, that's my real goal here. It's not to sell books, and I, I, I hasten to add, by the way, that every single penny, the book is done surprisingly well, and it's now in 40 countries around the world in 12 different languages. Every single penny, every single penny to prove my integrity of this process is donated to charity. I receive nothing, I don't net it off of anything. Everything's going to charity because this is my passionate work, and I really ask everyone to share in that work. Okay, well, let me get started. So, I am a Johnny come lately to this world of water. And maybe I have the passion of an aroused late in life convert. You know, Paul was first a Jew before he found the church, and he was on the road to Damascus when he gets struck with this insight and then his passion takes over. Well, I don't want to compare myself exactly to that, but I am, <laughs> for all kinds of reasons, and starting with grandiosity, <laughs> although, uh, Paul and I did start as Jews, so we we're okay in that department, so I, I don't know what's going to happen on the Uber ride back to Manhattan, but, you know, if, if something dynamic happens, you guys all heard it first. Okay, so, so five years ago, I'm a member of a foreign policy think tank, and five years ago I attended a meeting of it, and just by complete chance, the speaker was a fellow, a retired U.S. Air Force general, who had, uh, after he left the Air Force, he had gone to work for one of the 14 U.S. intelligence agencies. Everybody here knows the CIA, of course. But it turns out there were 14 agencies just like that. And he was one of the leaders of something called the National Intelligence Council. And the NIC is responsible for aggregating important data that shows long-term trend line information, generally producing top secret reports with the president and the five or eight leaders of Congress, sharing that with them. And that's generally as far as those reports go. You write, he writes these reports for an audience of maybe 10 or 20 people. In this particular case, the report got stripped down of some of its top secret information and got issued uh, as a public report. And it had been issued as a public report Friday before this session. So this was the first time he talked about it. And what he said was that the US government believed with a high degree of certainty, this was five years ago, he believed with a high degree of certainty that by the year 2025, 60% of the world's landmass and billions, with a B, billions of people around the world would be suffering from water scarcity. A subsequent report said that 40 of our 50 US states will be affected. Now, this was before the California drought, this is before the Texas drought, this is before Washington State and Oregon and Idaho all began to have these problems. Now, of course, in, in, in cyclical ways, every state now and again has problems, but I'm talking about before the problems with a capital P had begun happening. So as I'm watching in real time, the evolution of this guy's report, and I've come back and reread it now dozens and dozens of times, it turns out how remarkable it was and how prescient he was. This is before the Sub-Saharan Africa drought, if those of you who follow international affairs. This is before Vietnam fell into the worst drought, they believe, in 900 years. This is before, as I said, the California drought, which is now believed to be the worst drought over a thousand years. So th this is a real significant trend. Now, we all have been conditioned to think about these things in environmental and climate change terminology. And those, of course, are very significant reasons for the fact that we are going into a period of severe water scarcity. But I want to I want to help address for you also that it's not just climate change. It is climate change to a significant degree, but not just that. Right now, globally, we're about 7.5 billion people in the world, a little less. And the UN guesstimate is that we will finally level off a couple of decades from now between 10 and 11 billion people. If we are pinched on our water supplies right now, what will life be like when we are about 35, 40% more people? Second of all, we're not just more people, 
we're more affluent people. And so the lifestyles that we all kind of live here in America are to one degree or another starting to be adopted by more and more people around the world. And that, from a humanitarian point of view, is actually great news. But from an environmental and water point of view, it's very, very troubling. <coughs> Why? Because as people become more affluent, they consume enormously more amounts of water. And I'm not talking about long showers, although that adds to it, or a jacuzzi in the backyard, although that adds to it. I'm talking primarily about when people move up the development scale from a life that is sort of stone age-ish, with no electricity and no running water, and they eat a grain-based diet, everything changes when they start having electricity and running water in their homes, enormously water consumptive, and more significantly, when they start eating an animal-based diet. Now, there may be people here who are vegetarians or vegans, and you may be doing it for religious reasons or health reasons or ethical reasons, but I'm gonna venture to say that nobody here is a vegetarian or a vegan because they can't afford to buy meat. Well, in much of the world, that is the case. And you know what? That 1.3 billion people who the US government estimates in the next 10 years will be in the middle class around the world who are now in dire poverty, they are going to start eating meat. And it takes 17 times more water to grow a pound of beef as it does to grow a pound of corn, which is a basic part of their diet right now. Again, a big pinch on our, our supplies. Of course, climate change and pollution of our water resources, and something that, again, everyone here probably knows a lot about, but the general public knows nothing about. Because it's invisible, it's out of sight, out of mind, and that is our absolutely rotten national and international infrastructure. Right now, our national, national plumbing system loses approximately 30 to 35% of its water from the time the water has been brought to the destination and cleaned and been ready to be distributed into homes and into businesses and to agriculture, it was 30 to 35 percent. Well, that's absolutely unacceptable. We have, we are a world leader in many, many ways, but not in this. And you know why this is the case? And again, many of you are public officials or no public officials, and you know why this is the case? Because politicians in the current political environment, unless the population, unless the civic-minded folks call for a change, people respond to the needs of the public. So people say, hey, there's a broken window in the school. Or hey, there's a rat in the park. Let's fix that, let's fix that. Oh, there's a pothole when I drive my car down the road. Fix that. But that leaking pipe, nobody sees it. Nobody knows about it. Politician has no one demanding changes of them. And by the way, the politician said to fix that pipe, to fix the plumbing system, it's probably a five-year project, and I'm thinking of running for a different office two years from now, so why should I spend the money now so that my successor gets the credit for it? And the answer is that will continue until the public starts to demand the change. Okay, so I leave this session at the, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Let me just look at my watch. I leave this session at the Council on Foreign Relations, and I start wondering to myself, what, what are we gonna do? Are we cooked? Are we finished? Is civilization as we know it done? Those of you who have seen the movie Mad Max, are we, focused, are we focusing on a society and a civilization where it's sort of like Mad Maxian in terms of you know, sand and dirt and dust everywhere and specks of water to, to nurture us? Well, lo and behold, I discovered to my utter amazement a country, and you know what it is from the introduction, a country which has solved this water problem. And the country, of course, is Israel. And why is this so remarkable? Because if you go through the very same elements that I talked about before, population and affluence and, and climate change and, and infrastructure and things like that, why is this so remarkable? Because Israel, maybe some of you know this, maybe those of some of you have actually been there, Israel in the short time it's been an independent country since uh, right after World War II, has had the fastest rate of population rise in the world, a tenfold increase in its population. Its economy has grown so fast that other than South Korea and Singapore is the fastest growing economy in the world. Tenfold increase in population, 40-fold increase in, in, in national wealth. Climate change, it's lost 25% of its average annual rainfall. So you would think Israel would be about the worst country in the world. You would think it'd be among the most endangered in the world. And it's in the driest region in the world. And as Candace said, it doesn't exactly have the most friendly relations with neighbors where it could borrow from their resources. So guess what? What I discover is I'm looking for a model that I can share with elected officials and my, and my own thinking, long before I'm thinking of writing a book. What I discover is Israel doesn't just have water self-sufficiency for its growing population. Israel has a positive abundance of water, an abundance so rich, so deep, so remarkable, 
that it provides more than half of the water that the Palestinians use in the West Bank. It provides water to the Palestinians in Gaza, even during periods of conflict when rockets are flying out of Gaza. It provides an enormous amount of water to the Kingdom of Jordan to help stabilize that country, particularly now when they're dealing with massive numbers of Syrian civil war refugees. On top of that, Israel is completely self-sufficient in fruits and vegetables, and what is agriculture really other than value-added water? And on top of that, Israel has a multi-billion dollar agricultural export industry. So only a country that would be insane would start exporting its water, virtual water, but it's water nonetheless, if it had a shortage coming ahead. But it doesn't. And so I thought, in the remaining time, and we'll have open up for questions and comments, I thought it'd be interesting to share what it is that Israel did. And this is not completely what's in the book, but to some degree what's in the book. The book is divided into basically three-thirds. I'm a liberal arts major kind of a guy. It's not a lot of science in the book. Um, it, it's really more policy focused than ideas of how this was done. The book's divided kind of into three-thirds, sort of history, culture, society. What is it that Israel did and how did they do it? The second third is what are the technologies that transformed Israel? And the third part is what I call hydro diplomacy. How has Israel used this as a tool of engagement around the world? I won't be talking too much about the third or the first of those, but just a bit. So first of all, culture. Culture is an enduring phenomenon, and the Israeli culture is water revering, and I tell the story of how that comes to be and why that is. And the effect of that is, is exactly as the nursery rhyme that Jennifer shared with us, I wasn't thinking of it, I'd forgotten of it, but thank you for reminding me of it, is that we say rain, rain, go away, come again another day. And third, three-year-olds in the nursery programs there when it rains, they say clip, clap, 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 let's clap our hands and join. And it's a mindset of that. It's a mindset that in schools there, they teach, as they do here in America, hygiene, how to brush your teeth, how to take a shower, so forth. But a component of that is how you're supposed to properly use water while you're doing that. And I've spoken to plenty of Israelis who are 40 and 50 years old, some of them live in New York, and they say, you can't get that out of your head once you've been trained in this way. So a conservation-minded culture is very deep and widespread in Israel. Second of all, Israel also um, thinks much about uh, its governance of water. Now, Israel, like every country, has some better and worse things about its government, but in terms of its water, it has an outstanding system of governance and regulation, and the reason for that is it made a decision to make water completely apolitical. Water is managed and administered by an apolitical, technocratic water authority, where the only input from the politicians is every fifth year, the water commissioner is appointed by a, a designated cabinet minister, and then it's hands off. And that commissioner is responsible within the confines of his or her budget to then manage the water of the country. The next thing is a highest best use mentality. And the highest best use mentality, which I don't think we're gonna see anytime soon in America, is driven by the fact that Israel made a decision, and it was a decision, it didn't have to be this way, made a decision that it would manage all of its water universally and centrally. What is the highest, best use for every drop of water? And so that was a very important driver so that there are no favorites that can be played because somebody's a big campaign donor to somebody's, you know, somebody who's an important state official or whatever. And therefore, it, it nets out a system that people all make the claim as to how why they should have more water for their development, for their agriculture, whatever. And the government responds by saying, okay, Mr. Farmer, I agree that you should have more water, but do you have the right selection of crops? Maybe if you would change your selection of crops, you'd be able to utilize your water better and actually have a better economic output for that. So once upon a time, Israel was a major cotton country. But cotton, as you may know, along with alfalfa, is the highest water-consuming crop. And so government officials said, this is crazy. We should not be growing cotton ever, ever with fresh water. And so farmers were told, and I'll get to this in a moment, but farmers were told that you have to have an alternative source of water if you want to grow cotton. And so that kind of interaction with the, with the populace and the administrators has played a large role in this. In addition, Israel does something that's done almost nowhere else in the world, and that is it charges a real price for water. And that, I must say, along with the culture, is the most seminal and most important thing that Israel does. If I could ring a bell and make any change in America, it would be that everybody would pay the real price for their water. Because if they did, then they would want to use innovation and technology to save on water. They'd be rational people. But instead, we subsidize our water. We give it away for free, or we charge a price that's so unrelated to the real world. Maybe, perhaps, some of you actually know what your water bill is in your home. Maybe. 
but I will promise you that your water bill bears almost no resemblance to the actual cost of getting that water to your home, sourcing it, building up the infrastructure, cleaning it, bringing it to you, and then taking it out in the form of sewage. I promise you, because nowhere in America, nowhere in America is it done that way. Oh, everywhere there are subsidies, and you don't have to be an economist, but just have to remember Economics 101 from college, that subsidies always distort the marketplace because it changes your thinking. You don't act rationally. And so Israel does that. And finally, the point about technology. Israel made a decision early on, unlike utilities in most of the world, where the mindset is if it ain't broke, don't fix it, or good enough is good enough. The mindset is exactly opposite. The mindset there is that it's never good enough, that it's never good enough. a bunch of drop of water that's wasted, so we can't find a yet better way to make more efficient use of our water. And I want to talk about just three major technologies, but there are many, many, many more. Many more. Dozens more. Hundreds more. Three. First, Israel made a decision early on that it needed to have a revolution in agriculture. And some of you following the news know that Shimon Peres' funeral was today, the, one of the founding fathers of Israel. I was very blessed in the process of writing this book. I interviewed 220 people for this book, 190 Israelis, 20 Palestinians, 10 U.S. government officials. And one of those 190 Israelis was Shimon Peres when he was president of Israel. I came into what was supposed to have been a 15-minute interview, a courtesy interview that a friend of mine helped me to arrange through somebody he knew on, on Paris' staff. And we started talking, and he is true to his legacy of being a visionary and extraordinary man who will be missed badly. We sit down, he was 89 and a half years old. He was talking about uh, his planning for his 90th birthday bash, and the world leaders were coming in. At the age of 89 and a half, he was president of the State of Israel. And 15 minutes became a half hour. At the hour mark, his staffers started coming in and saying, so-and-so is waiting to see you. He confirmed that that so-and-so was an internal person. Ah, make him the afternoon, it's okay. I'll see him later. <laughs> and we ended up at the hour and a half mark, his chief of staff came in and said, Shimon, they're very informal in Israel. It's not like Mr. President. Shimon, enough already. <laughs> so I was finally uh, gently ushered out. Uh, of, the, of the room. I did have the great honor of giving him a copy of both the English and Hebrew edition of the book, and him being very kind. You'll see, those of you who get the book, you'll see uh, his, his uh, a, a short outtake from the review he wrote uh, on the back of the book. Uh, but what Paris's point was is that we can never have enough technology, and he said that even in the 1920s and 1930s, before there was a state, we knew that agriculture had to be transformed because agriculture is the largest user of water. Some of you know this, I'll share a statistic, it's amazing. The largest, except in Singapore where there's no agriculture, and in Israel where they've gotten on top of this, the largest use of fresh water in the world is always agriculture. In the US, it's about 70%. In the state of California, it's between 80 and 85% of their fresh water. Imagine how they would get rid of this problem that they have in California if they were actually was smart about how they use their water for agriculture. Some countries like Ethiopia or Egypt or Iran use 95% of their fresh water for agriculture. So is there any doubt that those countries have crises in fresh water for their populations? But Israel made the decision to fix their agricultural story early, and it's not a surprise that drip irrigation gets invented in Israel. And what is drip irrigation? In most of the world, how do they irrigate the field? One of two ways. Mostly flood irrigation. Turn on a great big pipe, let it flood the field, and the water slowly dribbles into the soil. Sometimes it hits the root. Most of the water, about 60% of it, evaporates away. Another 20, 25% dribbles into the soil with no impact on the roots. Lost story. The second way, for those of us who fly over the country, you sometimes see over the Midwest, those big circles on the fields, center pivot irrigation. Also enormously water consumptive. A little bit better than flood irrigation, but not a lot. And Israel invents drip irrigation bans by law flood irrigation, and drip irrigation says that you're gonna put a little tiny dripper, like a medicine dropper, a little tiny dripper at the root of plants, and you lose 0% to evaporation, and because it's right at the root, the uptake is nearly 100%. Very efficient. Second great thing Israel does, in 1952, the country is just barely four years old, they make a decision that sewage is too valuable to simply treat and discharge. And they build out a system, it takes them 30 years to complete this, but they build out a system, that, and I hasten to add, they were bankrupt at the time they started this. They had no money in the state coffers. They were a deeply debtor nation, 
They were under siege militarily. They had nothing but problems. They were doubling in size at that time from immigrants coming from all over the world. And nonetheless, they make the decision to prioritize water to a degree that they start building out a national system of treating, capturing, and treating all the sewage, treating it to a level so high that you actually could drink it if you had to. But instead, they build a parallel national uh, water infrastructure system and bring that water to either gardens or parks or lawns or agriculture. And therefore, I mentioned before, the farmers want to grow cotton. They can grow cotton, but they can only do it with treated, reused sewage water. And they built that in a national agricultural system around this idea of taking treated, reused water. And third grade technology they adopted, the third grade technology they adopt, and it's not beloved everywhere in the, all environmental circles, but the third one is desalination. And the reason why it is a relevant one is that Israel was a pioneer in desalination. The first prime minister of Israel, his name is David Ben-Gurion. I read his diaries, the, the relevant parts of his diaries. He talks about desalting the sea again and again and again. He said that we will make the desert bloom. 60% of Israel is desert. He said we will make the desert bloom. But the only way we can do that is that we can desalt the sea and take the water out of the ocean. And he did. Problematically at first, very expensive at first, but you know, you do it over and over again, you keep improving on it, improving on it. Now Israel has the world's largest desalination plant. It's the most energy efficient desalination plant, and it's the lowest cost per gallon of water plant in the entire world. And they're sharing that technology with countries near and far. And that's going to make a great big difference too. Especially in the coming years when the source of energy will not be carbon fuels, will be solar power, which is the next great wave of all this. So these three technologies alone transform this. I'll just add one more thing about technology and adoption. In Israel, every utility gets a penalty if they are not adopting some new innovative technology. They are actually financially fined for doing that. It's a failure. And if they do adopt one, they actually get a bonus. And, if they, and so the idea is, the government says, there are all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs out there with water technology companies. Find one that has an idea that you like, put it into your system. You could be an Israeli, you could be an American, you could be from New Jersey, go over there and try it the same way. Go over there, partner with this entrepreneur. If the system works, you've got a better water system. If the system doesn't work, discard it, you still get a bonus from us for having tried it. If it works, then another municipality and another municipality will try it. Within five years, the whole country is doing it. And then that country, that company rather, that entrepreneur, he has the most important thing or she has the most important thing that an entrepreneur can have. A real world ex experience that that entrepreneur can bring to countries and utilities all over the world. And so that has been the reason why Israel is now today the center of water innovation because of this very system, which we, I believe, as industrial policy would be wise to adopt as well. Um, since this is an environmental uh, organization and talk, I want to just uh, say a word or two about the effect of all of this on Israel's environment. I talk about this in, in my book. Israel is a very small country. As Jennifer said, it's about the size of New Jersey. Israel has very few rivers that run all year long, mostly rivers that run for a few hours at a shot during the winter. They still call rivers. And they have only one freshwater lake. And you would think that a country that is so water starved, you would think that its aquifers, its lakes, its rivers would all be in very bad condition. Because that's generally what happens. When you're water scarce, the first victim is the environment. But in Israel, the environment has a stakeholder system. And lo and behold, guess what? Today, Israel's rivers, with the sole exception of the lower part of the Jordan River, it's one freshwater lake, the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus famously walked, and all of its aquifers are in the best condition they have ever been in. And it is because of the fact that Israelis now have two-thirds of their water supply, farmers from, uh, from uh, treated sewage, household, households, 80% of household water comes from desalinated water. It's because of that that there's less pressure on the natural water that exists. And that's a real win-win-win for everyone and for the future as well. I'd like to, um, I'd like to close uh, by um, speaking about, if I may, about a larger policy implication of all of this. And that is, as I said at the outset, when the population believes in its government, when they believe it delivers well, then they're prepared to accept more of their government. And it's not a surprise 
that Israelis, which are a very fractious democracy, there's lots of political parties, it seems like every third person is a member of a different party. What's really quite remarkable about the country is that because of choices made by their leaders, years ago, the country has an extraordinarily cohesive society where people are prepared to give the benefit of the doubt to their leadership. And those three choices were, early on, that Israel would defend itself by itself with a great army that was decided before there was a state, and as a result of that, Israel today is the fifth, I think, greatest military power in the world, even though it's a country of only eight million people. It's kind of amazing. Second decision that the country makes is that they want to, instead of sort of allowing immigrants in on a basis of 10,000 a year or 50,000 a year or some sort of sustainably wise approach, they said anybody who wants to come from despotic authoritarian countries or from democracies anywhere in the world who want to come, please come. And they absorbed so many people that, as I said earlier, between 1948 and 1951, the country doubles in size and a tenfold increase. They make a decision that they're going to build out an extraordinary immigration absorption system. And there's an Israeli who has either served in the military or knows someone who served in the military. There's an Israeli who doesn't either himself or herself who wasn't an immigrant or the child of an immigrant or his next door neighbor isn't that case. And the third great decision they made was they made a decision early on that they were going to be second to none in water, that they would never allow water to be a stop, a gating issue for progress of their society or their economy. And that's a lesson, I think, for a lot of us, that it's a positive not just for itself, and that's important enough alone, it's a positive for the relationship between citizen and government. And I think I'll stop here. I'd be glad to answer any questions and take the conversation on.